Despite dozens of major games being delayed into 2022, from God of War Ragnarok and Horizon Forbidden West to Hogwarts Legacy and Gotham Knights, 2021 ended up being an excellent year for video games. The first 12 months of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X S era brought us over 70 games that IGN awarded a review score of 8 or higher, including 25 that earned a 9 or 10. Though, as is the case each year, not every new release was worth celebrating. In 2021, seven titles earned a 4 or lower from IGN. Those are games that we deemed bad, awful, painful, or downright unbearable. So as we say goodbye to the year that was, we're looking back on the best and the worst that 2021 had to offer. From under-the-radar indie darlings to big-budget AAA blockbusters, these are all 25 games we awarded a 9 or higher, followed by the 7 we scored 4 or lower. Chicory, A Colorful Tale is a pristine little adventure with fun puzzles and smart, cute writing, all overlaid with an extremely clever and surprisingly rich paint mechanic that replaces the need for combat and enhances a genre I was already familiar with. Its characters are pleasant and fun to spend time with, and its world has the exact right amount of secrets, art features, and collectibles to appease those who want to explore for longer without becoming overwhelming. All that on its own would be enough to recommend it, but the story that colors its play is disarmingly real, difficult, and heartfelt. Its world, writing, and gameplay work seamlessly together to challenge Chicory's audience not on grandiose hypotheticals, but in smaller, more personal feelings that may hit painfully, beautifully close to home. I am having a ton of fun with Chivalry 2. The maps, outside of a few balance issues, are a total blast. Everything from the shining armor to the soaring castle walls looks great, and there are a huge range of objectives to keep things interesting. Whether I'm swinging a sword or plucking away with a bow, combat hits that elusive sweet spot between accessible dumb fun and rewarding skill-based mechanics where the wheat is separated from the chaff. When you respawn and everyone around you is spamming the battle cry button as you rush headlong into certain death, you just know you're in for a rockin' time. I don't think I'll be putting away this sweaty coat of mail for a good while. Even without the curses themselves, Curse of the Dead Gods would be a standout roguelite with excellent combat, a smart structure that eases players into its difficulty, and a great variety of enemies, traps, and bosses across its three distinct temples. That strong foundation is only made better by the fun randomization curses bring to each run on top of the added strategic element that comes from having to balance the need to gear up quickly with the fear of taking on more corruption than you can handle. Its between-run progression systems didn't do much to hook me compared to the simple drive to best its hardest challenges, but even without that carrot on a stick, Curse of the Dead Gods is a blessing in disguise. Death's Door is a must for those looking to scratch the itch of a classic Zelda dungeon delving game, with the added bonus of impeccable combat against waves of foes in a creepy world. Secrets are plentiful enough to offset the low variety of rewards, and the cohesion of puzzle solving and combat encounters work terrifically to challenge me in all the right ways. While I wish the adventure didn't end so soon, as a Reaper of Souls, I should know, nothing lasts forever. The Forgotten City is an incredibly unique and self-aware adventure game that does a fabulous job of exploring complex ideas stemming from a basic question, what is objectively good? If you're expecting a full-blown action RPG that spans dozens of hours, this 10-hour jaunt may only whet your appetite, but it still sports an impressive ensemble cast of likable but flawed characters who each have something interesting to say. And without spoiling anything, there are moments where the writing is so good it's practically leaping out of your screen, standing up there with some of the best moments in any RPG. This ingenious blend of RPG mechanics, of visual novel style storytelling, and deck building roguelike gameplay is a beautiful recipe for a kind of game I never knew I wanted. Even though I've already spent the past week getting through each of Griftlands' campaigns multiple times, I'm still looking forward to my next run, and the run after that. Campaigns are short and challenging, making them highly replayable and memorable adventures that reward your time. It's kind of absurd that such an eclectic group of mechanics work together in such harmony, but once you're bitten by their charms, it's quite hard to put Griftlands down. Grime is an exceptional Souls-inspired take on the 2D Metroidvania. An intricate, stone-carved world full of mysteries provides a sure-footed foundation for deep, finely balanced combat and breathless, devious platforming. Best of all, it's a Souls-like that forgoes punishment in favor of encouragement, happy to lend you a helping hand whenever you fall. 
Guilty Gear's Drive is a milestone 2D fighting game that raises the bar for anime-like fighters in terms of its visuals, online netcode, and sheer creativity found in all aspects of its design. It's definitely a different flavor of Guilty Gear, with a heavier focus on fighting in the neutral and a slightly slowed down pace, but it maintains the series' soul with absolutely wild character designs, a flexible combo system, and a level of creativity both in its presentation and mechanics that is second to none in the genre. Halo has meant a lot to me over the past 20 years. From first landing on the ring in Halo 1, to the surprise Arbiter arc in Halo 2, to being heartbroken by Halo 5's abysmal storytelling, it's one of the few series in gaming where every new mainline entry really matters to me. After six years, it was fair to wonder, did Halo still belong in the best shooter conversation? And would I still care about it? I am both relieved and delighted that Halo Infinite emphatically answers both questions with a resounding yes. Yes! Turning us loose to explore a massive open ring with almost complete freedom to approach combat with a wide range of iconic guns, vehicles, and toys has absolutely brought Halo's single player campaign back into contention as one of the finest out there. And even though it drops the ball a bit with the story and lack of environmental variety, Infinite picks it back up again with style. It's so nice when a game actually lives up to sky-high expectations. Halo Infinite has been one of the most anticipated games out there since it was first announced three years ago. And for its multiplayer component to so fully deliver on the series' classic feel, while also keeping up with the modern-day competition in the FPS genre is a huge achievement. With some fantastic map designs, a collection of straightforward but highly engaging modes for both large and small groups, excellent weapons and gear options, and those delightfully bouncy and sticky grenades, Halo Infinite's multiplayer modes put it at the top tier of competitive shooters. Impressively, it manages to give nostalgic veterans the best of what they remember Halo multiplayer feeling like, while also smoothly introducing new players to the joys of Spartan combat. Rich, rewarding, and highly replayable, Hitman 3 is a superb installment of IO's idiosyncratic but much-loved stealth series. The fundamentals haven't changed since 2016, but its collection of outstanding maps makes for a refined, reliable, and robust curtain closer to the current Hitman trilogy. Six maps may sound slim, but each one is huge and designed to be played several times over, and even then it's very unlikely you'll have uncovered all of its creative and surprising assassination opportunities. There really isn't a weak one in the bunch. This barcoded butcher has made a lot of appearances over the past 20 years, but Hitman 3 is definitely one of his best. Fun, fast, and damn near photorealistic at times, Hot Wheels Unleashed is a surprising and brilliant arcade racer. Carefully detailed, highly customizable, and buoyantly uncynical, this toy racer defies all expectations with remarkable attention to detail, excellent track design, and an accessible handling model that still rewards high skill. The racing may be tiny, but make no mistake, this game is enormous fun. Inscription is a surprising and delightful meta twist on the digital card games that have exploded in recent years. Its unsettling story is the perfect vehicle for its ever-evolving mechanics, which constantly keep the simple but entertaining card game at its heart fresh. It's a wonderfully strange game, but Inscription is truly excellent because it's also a genuinely fun one. And for the best experience, you should probably go in knowing as little as possible. Here we go! It Takes Two is a spectacular co-op adventure that lays down a path of great gameplay ideas and uses it to play a giddy game of hopscotch. It's beautiful, breakneck paced and bubbling over with creativity, and playfulness and experimentation are rewarded at every turn. If you have any kind of co-op partner in your life, be they spouse, friend, sibling or other, it Takes Two is a truly joyful trip you really need to take together. Knockout City is one of the best team-based PvP games to come out in years. It's a fresh take on the American School Guard staple that proves that lowering the mechanical bar for entry doesn't have to come at the cost of deep tactical gameplay. Every match has the potential to be a dynamic combat experience that even the most hard-boiled shooter fan can appreciate, all thanks to the clever balance between throws and catches, exciting special balls, and well-designed maps to brawl through. 
Life is Strange True Colors is a fantastic game that offers a great story with solid pacing, and unlike previous games in the series, it left me with feeling that every choice I made mattered. In picking up where Don't Nod left off, Deck Nine has gone above and beyond to create the best game in the series to date, and I am excited to see what the studio does with it next. Mass Effect 2 Legendary Edition remains the high point in an amazing trilogy, and its 4K makeover allows its graphics to hold up nearly as well as its strong gameplay, excellent story, and fantastic characters. With the DLC smoothly integrated into the flow of the campaign, this epic sci-fi RPG contains dozens of hours of exciting missions that explore the interesting backstories of your teammates and their respective alien cultures. The final couple of hours of the campaign are a truly brilliant culmination of the emotional connections we're led to build with them. If you've played it before, it's more than flexible enough to give you a different experience this time. And if you haven't, you absolutely should. Metroid Dread gets so much right after so many years that I'm almost resentful that we didn't get the same game and a few sequels starting back in 2005. But instead, I'm incredibly happy to play a Metroid that is back at the top of its game. Even though it's the latest in a decades old series, Dread has just enough clever innovation to balance its familiarity. The universally recognizable mix of tough puzzles, tougher boss fights, ever-evolving exploration options, and intricate level design that recent games like Hollow Knight and Ori get so right has an origin point. It's Metroid. I love those games, but the Metroid team, a mix of old and new developers now, have shown that they know how to do it best. You okay, Bolts? Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is a stunner. It not only gives the latest generation of consoles a game that looks as beautiful as the improved tech promised, but it's also a fantastic experience to play. Insomniac has been around the Ratchet & Clank block plenty of times before, but Rivet and other new characters add so much charm, wit, and heart to a franchise I've loved for most of my life. That's coupled with series-best action platforming gameplay and incredible art and sound design across the board. Rift Apart may not be the biggest adventure around, but its big heart, wild weapons, and incredible detail easily make it one of the most memorable of the generation and the year so far. Armature has put a lot of love into making Resident Evil 4 a fresh action horror experience. From the reworked and extremely flexible controls to making puzzles less of a chore and more fun to interact with, the thoughtful changes here make it an easy recommendation for anyone who owns an Oculus Quest 2. That's true whether you've played it multiple times across different hardware generations already, or if it's your first time, you'll be experiencing this modern classic. Given that it wasn't originally designed for VR in mind, it's truly remarkable how well Resident Evil 4 has been adapted. Subnautica Below Zero is another big frosty bite out of one of the best open world survival games to come along since the genre's inception. It might not be as massive as the original, but there is so much style and substance packed into each trench, cave, and bloodthirsty shark squid. What the hell is that thing? That it's hard to complain. New vehicles, new gadgets, and an across-the-board tune-up to technical performance and quality of life round out the experience skillfully. Whether you are ravenous for more Subnautica like me, or don't even know what you are in for, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I'm very pleased to say that Bandai Namco has hit the mark in reinvigorating the 26-year-old Tales series. Tales of Arise brings to life a beautifully realized world that isn't afraid to tackle heavy subjects and knows when to take its foot off the gas for a bit. Its characters feel real and relatable even in fantastical situations, and a fresh and fun combat system livens up their battles. Combined with plenty of quality of life improvements ironing out some of the series' long-standing frustrations, this is an easy recommendation to not just fans of the long-running series, but anyone interested in diving into an expansive action RPG. Whether I'm fighting for my life, plundering forgotten barrows, or just enjoying watching the sun play across the water in a calm moment of respite, Valheim has created a world I'm consistently joyful to live in and discover more of. It's definitely a traditional survival game at heart, which means the further in you get, the more you have to put up with some tedious grinding before you can get back to the good parts. But those good parts are very good, especially when you get to take to the seas or test your skill against its imposing bosses. And the simple but exceptional art and music create a strong sense of place in which to do it all. Grab some mead and come join me by the fire. I don't think you'll be disappointed. 
The magic of Wildermyth is that it loves its stories so much that it builds its entire structure, from graphical style to prose to combat to campaign structure, around its characters becoming legendary. Those ideas are cemented in place with a legacy system that turns those characters back into stories again, weaving design and narrative together throughout. And while Wildermyth gives the impression of being a charmingly ramshackle indie RPG, it's surprisingly flexible and tight under the hood. All of that adds up to a truly special experience. Despite its seemingly endless complexities, Deathloop is one of the most confidently designed games I've ever played. Arcane Studios has crafted a world made of ideas linked by meaningful connections. Time influences space, space influences tactics, and tactics influence loadouts. Its unique, high concept ideas around time loops and non-linear investigation work are implemented with elegance, making its systems feel effortless to navigate, learn from, and ultimately master. A new high water Watermark for Arcane and developers of similar games to aspire to, Deathloop is a game like no other. Disco Elysium is still the unique blend of noir detective fiction, traditional pen and paper RPGs, with a large helping of existentialist theory that it always was. But it's now even better than ever, removing any of the minor gripes I had with the original by adding new quests and a full cast of well-voiced characters. The final cut elevates Disco Elysium from an already phenomenal RPG to a true must-play masterpiece. Forza Horizon 5 is a deep and nuanced car nirvana for rev heads and auto geeks to endlessly collect, tinker and experiment. It's also an extremely accessible buffet of racing spectacle open to everyone from day one. Deluxe edition diehards to Game Pass nomads, no matter their driving skill or mechanical knowledge. It's an occasionally goofy but always earnest valentine to Mexico's world famous culture and a romantic ode to the magic of road tripping through postcard perfect vacation vistas. It's a long haul MMO inspired racer that's exploding with more races, activities and event types that can comfortably fit on the map and yet it still always feels relaxed rather than daunting. It never locks you into something you don't want to do and steadily rewards you for however you choose to play it. It looks beautiful, it sounds magnificent, and it is glorious to play. Yes, Forza Horizon 5 is a lot of things. Above all, however, it is the result of a racing studio at the peak of its craft, and the best open world racing game I've ever played. Balan Wonderworld isn't always an awful platformer, but it is a consistently boring one. It's full of charming character designs, fun music, and the occasional hint of a clever idea, but its insistence on being a one-button game with a needless number of underwhelming abilities rots it to the core. Its level design never really evolves beyond the most rudimentary obstacles, but it's the fundamentally flawed choices behind that mediocrity that take Balan Wonderworld from bland to outright bad. Under all the aggravating bugs and shoddy design, Baldo the Guardian Owl is still a vast action-adventure RPG filled with puzzles and treasures to find. If you stick with it long enough, you can have some genuine fun exploring this Ghibli-style world and its simple story. But it hardly pays off by the very end. The vast sea of technical issues and unfair enemies you need to pass through with little or no direction before you get there make it easy to see a lot of people quitting Baldo before they've given it anywhere near that long. Big Rumble Boxing Creed Champions is easy to pick up and play, but it has very little to keep folks hanging around, even for Rocky and Creed Saga superfans. It simply doesn't have the modes, the content, or the atmosphere to truly go the distance. Yo, Adrian, I did it! I did it! I badly wanted Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance to be an awesome co-op version of the pencil and paper tabletop RPGs I've loved for decades. But it just isn't. It's a bland, boring trek through repetitive encounters that brings nothing to the table that a dozen games haven't done better. It offers very few moments of genuine excitement, and it's filled with bugs and annoying design choices throughout. I can praise its faithful look and feel, which captures much of what makes the Forgotten Realms a great setting, but there's very little else to recommend about this unpolished mess of a hack and slash RPG. Though it has a fun and colorful style, none of it can save Pixel Junk Raiders from a painfully thin sense of progression, lackluster combat, annoying objectives, and difficulty curves that are neither fair nor rewarding. 
When both exploration and combat fail to get their hooks into you, there's nothing pulling you back in for another run, and that undermines any game that's meant to be played through again and again. If Earthblood had at least been a fun beat-em-up, I would have been disappointed by the missed opportunity, but glad we got a somewhat decent game about that one aspect of Werewolf the Apocalypse. But the clumsy, unsatisfying combat takes the bite even out of that, and leaves us with not much worth our time. The stealth mechanics are actually pretty good in how they interact with the level design, which would be more of a consolation prize if Cyanide wasn't selling the fantasy of being a massive, savage apex predator. But it didn't do much to salve my frustration with the combat, the characters, the animations, the AI, and just about everything else. When the next full moon rises, I'll raise my voice and howl in the hopes that maybe someday we might get a werewolf game worthy of the World of Darkness lore. FIFA 22 Legacy Edition on Switch is the latest example of little to no respect being paid towards a fan base asked to pay a premium price for a virtually unchanged product. It's just not good enough. EA, please stop this. Nerf Legends is a painful first-person shooter that manages to suck all of the childhood fun out of its over-the-top plastic weapons with abysmal gunplay, tedious puzzles, tons of bugs, and a multiplayer mode that literally doesn't work at all. It's disappointing to see a concept with so much potential to be an entertaining, light-hearted FPS squander it so entirely with a broken, harrowing lemon of a game. Even masochists looking for something to heckle should steer clear of this mess. And there you have it. Those were our best and worst reviewed games of 2021. For more on our look back at the year, be sure to check out our list of every canceled and ending show in 2021. For everything else gaming, movie, and streaming related, you're already in the right place. IGN.